Joint count statistics. We'll start with a quick recap of the notion of a spatial autocorrelation statistic. As you remember, such a statistic is a combination of attribute similarity, the similarity of values at two locations, and locational similarity. The latter is typically expressed in a spatial weights matrix. So formally, we have two elements. One is a function that relates x at i and x at j, the variable x. And the other is the element of the weights matrix corresponding to i and j. And so the statistic then takes on the general form of a double sum over all origins, if you wish, and all destinations, or all rows and all columns, of two elements, a product of two elements. One is a function that relates the value at i and j, f of xi and xj. The other is the element of the weights matrix corresponding to i and j, w, i, j. And of course, since the weights matrix is zero when i and j are not neighbors, that element, that part of the product, uh, zeroes out. So only the relationship f xi xj is only counted for the i's and j's that are actually neighbors. The special case we're considering is for binary data, data that only take on a value of 0 and 1, two values. For example, presence and absence of an, a particular phenomenon like a, a, a crime as we'll see in the example. By convention, one of the two is coded 1, the other one is coded 0, but it doesn't really matter which one is 1 or 0. Um, in the literature, the 1s are typically referred to as B for black, and the zeros are typically referred to as W for white. Um, in practice, it's often a good idea to take 1 for the smaller category. The big difference between this, the joint count statistics, and event analysis, like point pattern analysis, is that here we have all the locations, so we have both the presence and the absence of the phenomenon, so both zeros and ones. In point pattern analysis, so to speak, we only have the ones. We only have the locations of the events. We don't have locations for the non-events. And as the example in this section, we'll use the presence of burglaries in neighborhoods in part of Cincinnati, Ohio. These neighborhoods uh, have either no burglaries, there's 343 of those, or they have experience of burglary, there are 114 of those. The red ones, the light red ones, are the ones with the burglaries. So what are we doing now in a joint count statistic? We have to figure out how to formally express this match of value and location. And the principle behind the joint count statistic is to count the number of times similar values occur for neighbors, and those are called joins, hence the name joint counts. We count the number of joins. And what are the similar values that can occur um, if two neighboring locations have the event present? They both have one. So then we count that as a BB join, a black-black join. On the other hand, if there are no events in either of the neighbors, 0, 0, then we count that as a WW join. And similarly, we can also count when there's an event next to a non-event as a BW or WB join. More formally then, positive spatial autocorrelation is the similarity of neighbors. And so it's either having a 1 in both location or having a 0 in both locations. And recall that our uh, statistic consists of a function of xi and xj. So we have to figure out what is an appropriate function so that xi and xj are both counted when i and j are neighbors. And that function is the product of xi and xj. So with xi and xj both equal 1, the product will be 1 for a join, that is when two neighbors both have 1s, and will be a 0 otherwise. For the absence of the phenomenon, ww, 
we have two zeros, so now we have to take the complement in order to make sure that they are counted. So then the attribute similarity is the product of 1 minus xi times 1 minus xj. With xi and xj both 0, the product equals 1, so it's counted. It is a joint. So those are the two cases for positive spatial autocorrelation. Negative spatial autocorrelation, we have dissimilar neighbors, so they are different. One of them has the event, the other one doesn't. So we had to either have 1 or 0, or 0 and 1. And typically for dissimilarity measures, we express this as the square difference. Squared so that the sign doesn't matter, and difference so that we have a 1, one, um, one value of the x's is a 1 and the other value is a 0. So the difference will be either plus 1 or minus 1, but after squaring, that becomes 1. So now we have the three cases, and these three cases each result in formal joint count statistics. So with the weights, typically in binary form, so the neighbors, if i and j are neighbors, you have a 1. If i and j are not neighbors, you have a 0. The BB, black black, joint count statistic, is 1 half, and 1 half is there just for convenience, uh, because e every join is counted twice, so to speak, from i to j and then from j to i, so there's no point counting this double. The statistic, as we saw, the similarity is xi times xj, and that is multiplied by the weight. So the weight can be either 1 or 0. If i and j are neighbors, the weight is 1, and the product 1 is counted. If i and j are not neighbors, the product is not counted. And if i and j don't have the same value, then it's not counted either. So this statistic only counts the cases where there is 1 for both observations, i and j. Then, as we saw, WW uses the complement, 1 minus xi times 1 minus xj. So again, if xi and xj are both 0, the product is 1. If they're also neighbors, then wij is 1. It's counted. If they're not neighbors, it's not counted. If they're not both 0, it's not counted either. And negative spatial autocorrelation in the BW statistic is the double sum of the square difference. Again. If uh, I, xi and xj are different, it will be counted, and it also will be, and it only will be counted if a, i and j are also neighbors. So if wij is one, because we exhaust all the possibilities, the sum of the three statistics is equals all possible neighbor relations, or because we took one half, that is one half the sum of all the weights. The sum of all the weights is expressed typically in the literature as S0, S sub O, sub 0. So the, the sum of the BB, WW, and BW is exactly one half of that, one half of the sum of all the non zero elements in the weights matrix. To put things into perspective, we not only have the actual locations of the burglaries which we just saw, but we also have uh, created two random reshufflings of the burglaries. So we have the same number of burglaries, 114, but these maps are actually spatially random maps. And the reason for this is to compare what the joint count statistics would be under spatial randomness relative to the value that we actually observed. So what we observe when we compute these statistics is that in the actual case the BB statistic which is the one of most interest is 130 so there are 130 cases where two neighbors two neighbors both had burglaries in the random cases the, that number is much lower it's 95 for the first random sample and 79 for the other one the other statistics are given as well but they're really not of as much interest in this case, and you see also that they're much more similar between the three uh, cases, the actual one 
and the two random ones. The sum of the three statistics, as expected, is exactly half of the sum of all the non-zero weights. How do we now know whether this BP statistic of 130 is uh, significant or not? And there are uh, two approaches to this. The one approach is based on an analytical derivation. It's based on sampling theory. Basically, you can think of the events happening in a location as a draw from a binomial distribution with a probability of happening. And so we can uh, replicate what these counts would be under the assumption of a binomial distribution. And so given that assumption, we can figure out what the moments are, the mean, the variance, and so on. And then we can use an approximation where we basically compute a z value. We take the joint counts. We subtract its mean under the theoretical expectation of a binomial distribution. That's spatially random. We divide it by the standard deviation, and that's the z value. And then we can approximate that as a normal uh, random variable, which is actually not a very good approximation, but it's one way to deal with this. So in our case, we see that the, the mean under randomness is 91.7, much less than what we observe the 130. The variance is 77.9. The z value, which we get by taking 130, subtracting 91.7, and dividing by the square root of 77.9 is 4.37, and that's highly significant by any standard. So this is the analytical approach. The preferred approach, however, is called a permutation approach, also sometimes called randomization, but that's very confusing, as we'll see in a little bit when we discuss Moran's eye. Basically, what the permutation inference does is mimic spatial randomness. So it reshuffles the 0, 1 values over the locations and recomputes the statistic each time. And by doing this many times, you build a reference distribution of what values BB would take under spatial randomness for that particular sample. So if you go back to our random maps, both of these were instances of a random reshuffling of the ones over the locations, and a statistic was recomputed for those uh, values. So then, what do we do with this? We compare the actual statistic, in our case the 130, to this reference distribution. And we're interested in how extreme our actual statistic is with respect to the random, to the reference distribution. Because remember, the reference distribution is for spatial randomness. And one way to summarize this is by means of a graph, which we'll see in a second. Another way to numerically summarize this is by means of a pseudo p-value. And it's very important to realize that the pseudo p-value is just a handy summary. It's not actually a p-value. And I'll get back to that in a second. And it's computed as a ratio of m plus 1, where m is the number of values equal to or more extreme, in this case, greater than the statistic. So if we have uh, five BB statistics from the random uh, permutations that are equal to or greater than 130, then the numerator would be 5 plus 1 or 6. R is the number of replications, and typically that's chosen to be a number one less than a round number so that it's easy to get the fraction. So, for example, if we would do 99 replications, then R plus 1 would be 100, and our pseudo p-value would be 0.06, the 6 from the numerator divided by the 100 in the denominator. Uh, by convention, 99 is probably not enough. 999 is plenty. 
keep in mind that the number of replications determines how small your pseudo p-value can be. For example, with 99 permutations, the best quote-unquote one can do, so the case where no values from the random permutations are equal to or larger than the observed one, then the numerator would be 1 and the denominator would be 100. So the smallest p-value one could get is 0.01. That doesn't mean that that's less significant, say, than a case where you would have 0.001, which is qualitatively the same case. There is no value from the random permutation that is equal to or larger than the observed statistic. But now, instead of 100 in the, in the numerator, you have 1,000. So therefore, the pseudo p-value is 0 0.001. But both are qualitatively the same in that no value from the permuted references distribution is, uh, exceeds the observed value. In our, our example, um, this graph summarizes what goes on with the pure permutation approach. So we see the blue graph gives the, and the histogram give the distribution of the BB statistic under the null hypothesis. This is now empirically, not based on a binomial assumption. So um, this is purely the result of the random permutations. And then the red vertical line is the observed statistic of 130. And we see very clearly here that the 130 is well outside the reference distribution. And hence, we can conclude that it is significant. To compare to one of our random cases, here's one of the permuted um, cases in one of the sample maps and with the BB statistic of 95. And here we see that the 95, the red line, is right in the middle of the reference distribution. So we have no reason whatsoever to reject the null hypothesis of spatial randomness in this case. And we'll see this again later on, this idea of using the data themselves to build inference. We reshuffle the values over the locations, recompute the statistic many times, and build a reference distribution. And then we compare the observed statistic to this reference distribution. And to summarize that, we can compute a pseudo p-value, but really the key is the comparison of the observed statistic to the full reference distribution.